Well, good evening. We are at Russell Creek Park in Plano, Texas. This is the first in several locations where I will be looking at the Phoenix TK30 right here. They call it a white laser. We'll discuss that in just a second. But before I do, I really want to thank PhoenixStore.com for providing this light and making this review possible. If you are interested in a purchase after the review, there is a link in the video description. All right, for comparison, we have the PD40R V2, TK30, TK16 V2. Well, the 30 certainly looks uh, a bit taller, but looks very much like the uh, other three lights here. However, when we look out the front, there is a pretty considerable difference. Now, you may have heard the term LEP flashlight or white laser is often used a lot. I mean, what does all of that really mean? Well, very simply, laser is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Lasers, as we are familiar with, are often called single wavelength. They're very close to monochromatic, that is, the range of emitted frequencies is so narrow that we tend to view the light as being monochromatic. There are, however, broad spectrum lasers, even lasers that emit multiple wavelengths. LEP, which is what the emitter is here, stands for laser excited phosphor. Very simply, 447 nanometer it's roughly a blue-violet laser is used to excite a yellow phosphor that is backed by a metal substrate for reflection. The reflected light is very heavy on blue and yellow wavelengths. Blue and yellow are complementary colors. Those hues tend to cancel, leaving a more broad-spectrum white beam. Now, is that really a laser? Well, if you go with the stimulated emission part of the definition, a lot of people might say so. Let's not argue about that. The light, of course, is further focused and then directed downrange, so let's focus on one thing that is inarguable, and that is that the emitted light has an extremely high degree of spatial coherence. Not as much as a traditional laser, but very high. What that means for you is that this beam is extremely narrow and it has a tendency to not spread out over distance. So that's it for physics class this evening. Uh, before we get into beam shots, I do want to spend just a minute or so talking about how I would use this light in a practical perspective. Well, if you've seen any of my previous videos, you know that my use case is primarily wilderness search and rescue. But as we scan out over here, I'm at a very large park, and I'm only showing you a very tiny fraction of the overall park itself. So imagine something like searching for a lost child out here when it's dark. I have two challenges. One, my entire search is going to be very time critical. But I have wide areas to search. I don't know how many people are helping with the search. So I have to be able to somehow cover a very wide area in which downrange visibility. Uh, right now, if you see that road in the distance, that's about 550 to 600 yards from my current position. And there are many places out here in the park that I could stand and have a maximum line of sight exceeding six or 700 yards. So how do I search these wide areas uh, very quickly and efficiently? Well, I like to use a one-two punch. The main thing I rely on here is thermal night vision. So I'll do a very wide scan of a pie slice using night vision. 
I can very easily make thermal detections out to 1,500 yards on a perfectly clear night with this device. But therein lies the problem. I can make detections many, many hundreds of yards downrange. The challenge is to very quickly turn detection into identification. So you've probably seen in other videos the Vortec Optics Solo RT that I use. That's a handheld monocular. Another thing that I use if I can create a static observation station is I'll often use uh, spotting scopes such as this. But this is where a very long throw narrow beam light like the TK30 comes in. I get a thermal detection downrange. I don't have any other flashlight that's capable of illuminating at that distance to make an identification. Normally what I would have to do is invest several hundred yards in walking to close the distance to make an identification, but now I can use the TK30 to illuminate a very, very specific point many hundreds of yards downrange in tandem with a magnified optic to turn detection into identification. So that gives you just a very brief overview of what we're going to be doing. I'm going to be taking the light out at a variety of places here in the park once it gets dark and we'll see what the beam looks like and I'll start zeroing in on what distances that I can uh, make identifications with using this platform. Well, we're going to start with something that's not so challenging in terms of distance, probably uh, just under 300 yards, but we are still at dusk. We have some photonic barriers, light pollution from the surrounding city, I have no headlamp on, and let's say I've got a thermal trace at the far end of that tree line in front of me. That's a very difficult thing to illuminate, even with a, a fairly high lumen flashlight. So I'm going to get the uh, TK30 out, and even fighting back into some of those barriers, yeah, I'm definitely lighting up the uh, the tree line. I can look at it through the uh, Vortex Optics Solo RT and get details out there. And so even in a light polluted environment, I'm getting good downrange visibility. Okay, we're sticking in that uh, roughly 300 plus yard range, about 315 to 20 to the absolute other end of the lake. Still twilight. I wanted to first light this up with the TK16 V2. This is uh, 3,100 peak lumens, and I'm not even getting visibility to the other edge of the lake. I mean, I'm, I can barely tell that there's another edge out there, but no detail. So let's put that one away, and here we go with the TK30. And again, great detail, not just to the opposite edge of the lake, but to the tree line. And with the magnified optic, I could even see inside the tree line. Here is another light pollution test. Again, we're still at twilight. It's not completely dark yet. You can see the cars moving off in the background, 550 to 600. We've got a building off to our right with light and a couple of bright lights from the athletic field off to my uh, two o'clock position. So there's a there's kind of a dark corridor in front of me so I'm going to presume that let's say I have a uh, thermal hit there. I've got some sort of thermal signature but I'm not sure what it is. Well let's get the uh, TK30 out and there we go. I can even see something reflective off of somebody walking around the trail at the opposite end. Again, that's got to be a good 600 yards from this position. So an interesting corollary to that last test is what is it like looking back into bright light? Well, we've definitely got two of them right ahead of me, so let's do a quick scan of that athletic field.
Yeah, we can see way back in there, even with that uh, bright light shining directly at me. So here we have kind of a, another, I call it a long dark corridor. I have my headlamp in turbo mode, approximately 2000 lumens, and I could make an identification about to the second light post to my left. So I'm going to turn the headlamp down and the TK30 on. Oh, okay, so there's uh, another fence line out there. Okay, then we go out into open field and I can see all the way to a uh, building right there by the road. Yeah, let me look through the optic here. Oh yeah, that's totally impressive. Distance, I'm not quite sure. I'm going to have to guess again 300 plus yards, but absolutely fantastic visibility. Well, this will be my final test of the night here at the park. Looking back out to the road from a point that uh, I believe is in the ballpark of 700 yards, there's a, a light on a structure at the entrance to the park right out there, and that's what I'm going to try to uh, illuminate. It's actually beyond the roadway. I don't know if you can see the cars moving in front of it. And so... There we have it, and if I look into the, uh, the optic, I can't see everything. We have a lot of particulates in the air. You can see we have a lot of photonic barriers to work through, but I'm guessing I could get detail out to about 500 at least, maybe a tiny bit more. So that's what I'm taking away from the test tonight is kind of four to 500 yards with the magnified optic dealing with photonic barriers and uh, surrounding light pollution. But hey, this is urban search and rescue. That's what the game is. So next test, we're going to take it out into a darker environment. We'll probably do some uh, lake searches and push the distance out from there. I'll also show you some wilderness searches at more tractable distances so we can see what it looks like in a wilderness environment. Well, here we are at Oak Point Nature Preserve in Plano, Texas. I'm looking out over a lake, and I have the iPhone in 2.5x zoom. You can see an opening in the trees at the far end of the lake. There's a stake or a wooden post in between the trees. It probably won't show up with all the clouds, even in this zoom mode. But from where I'm standing to that post is almost exactly 600 yards. So I just wanted you to see this while there was some light still out. And I will be coming back when it's darker. We will light this up with the TK30 and see what it looks like. So hang on and through the magic of editing, I will be back in just a few seconds. All right, we are back. I have my headlamp in 1800 lumen combined flood and spot. It's a fairly dark night because of the cloud cover. However, we do have light pollution from the surrounding city. And so uh, with that and the uh, headlamp, you can kind of make out the outline of the lake. I'm in 1x zoom because I want you to see the full extent of the beam. So hang on, let me uh, put my headlamp down to uh, the lowest mode. There we go. Let's get the TK30 going. And I, even with the unaided eye, can see the reflection off of a sign at the other end of the lake. Let me look into the optic because I can see signs of the ground on the other side again even with the unaided eye let me check this out with the optic and with the vortex optic solo rt i can just barely make out that post that's pretty impressive 
Uh, there's a lot of wind blowing tonight. You can see that there are particulates in the air. Uh, we had a really bad storm yesterday, so there's not as much dust and stuff as there would be otherwise. But, uh, wow, that's pretty good. I mean, with a magnified optic, I can make uh, identifications out to 600 yards. So, how far can we go? Well, in the words of a famous movie, I think we're going to need a bigger lake. Well, here we are at Cottonwood Lake at the LBJ Grasslands. I'm looking over towards an inlet or a cove at the opposite end of the lake. Let me bump the zoom up to 2.5. That's the area that we're going to be lighting up tonight. And from where I'm standing to the absolute opposite end of that little inlet is right at 800 yards. Unfortunately, there's some trees blocking that line of sight, so I can't quite illuminate the full 800, but we'll try to get close, and that's the goal of tonight's exercise. So once again, um, hang on, wait till the sun goes down, and in the magic of editing, I'll be back in a few more seconds. Well, we're back. It's a very clear and dark night. I have my headlamp on turbo, 3,000 lumens combined flood and spot. But as you can see, there's a ton of particulates and dust in the air. Some of that is from the fact that we had um, wind out most of the day, and the rest of it is just from uh, vehicle traffic. I could wait hours for this to go down. I was unable to do the 800-yard test. There's just too much dust in the air. So I'm going to back off to something more in the 5 or 600 range. Let me get the headlamp down here. And there is the TK30. I mean, even with the unaided eye, I can see the opposite shore. So let me look through the... Uh, Solo RT, and yeah, I can see some detail, but again, particulates are really not my friend tonight, and I've got yet another vehicle coming. So I'm going to shut this down and say 600 yards under average conditions. Under ideal, I could probably do 800. I'm going to finish up with a couple more uh, tests here, then we'll close down the review. So we saw the beam cut through some pretty heavy particulates in that previous test, and we can actually use that to our advantage uh, if we're lost or if, in my case, I'm trying to uh, signal other responders to make it to a difficult location, and we can use the light as a beacon. I'm looking straight back up into the night sky, and there's what the light looks like as a beacon. That's that's probably one of the best signal lights I've seen in a really long time. In this case, we can use all the uh, particulates in the air to our advantage. So if I'm trying to help direct someone to my position, or you know, if you're lost and in trouble, this might be uh, something good you want to keep in your ruck. I happen to be a member of a number of Facebook groups, and before I did this review, I asked a lot of people what they would like to see, and I was kind of surprised 
that the number one thing that seemed to be on everyone's mind was, well, how much abuse can this, uh, can this light take? Well, there's kind of two ways to look at abuse. One is to abuse the platform, to force it to failure. Well, that way you know what the edge of the envelope is. I think it's more reasonable for a light of this nature to look at what's the worst I might do to it under what I would call normal use circumstances. And for me, in search and rescue, normal use tends to be probably a bit more brutal than, uh, than most people. Now, I've been using this light for almost exactly a month. And for the most part, I've had it right here, either on the left shoulder of my ruck or inside the ruck. And I literally take this thing, that's how I put it in the vehicle, that's how it rides. I've been out here to the grasslands three or four times. Um, you, you know what rocky, bumpy roads are like, so it's been putting up with that vibration. But what I wanted to do right now for this last test is simulate what was the worst thing I've personally done to a light since I've been in search and rescue. And it was, in fact, last year uh, during the height of allergy season, it went something like this. I was transferring a light from a container I was going to take it out because I staged all of my gear in the truck bed, and then all of a sudden, from about chest height, oh, shoot! Oh, I dropped it. And then, of course, I stepped forward. Whoa! Oh, I stepped on it. I mean, I really stepped on it. Uh, there we go, right there. Uh, let's get this thing up. And what do we have? Well, there we go. That's probably the worst thing I've done to a flashlight in at least the last few years in what I might call normal use cases. So let me go ahead and wrap this thing up. I think this is really easy. Uh, this is a light that I want even if I don't have a use case for it. Fortunately, I have a couple of good use cases. And as far as LEP lights go, the thing I like about this particular platform is it has a very, very good mix of you know entry level price again relative to a lot of LEP lights in the market uh, it's got a very good form factor it fits in a lot of places for me as a largely mobile ground-based element that's something that is really important like right now I'm wearing my reflective vest and this fits comfortably in the uh, top left pocket it's definitely earned a place in my ruck, and I hope you got enough information from this review to make a decision one way or the other. As always, thank you very much for your time, and thank you for watching the video.